Well, let me say again just how much I've enjoyed being with you this uh, this this weekend, even though it's been a little bit of an odd sort of uh, meeting with social distancing and uh, staying a little bit further apart and those sorts of things. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, first time even getting back in a building or, or pretty close to it. I know that's the case of some of the visitors, at least that I've talked to. It's it's uh, it's it's strange year, a strange time of year, but it has been good to be together. And I appreciate so much the invitation and opportunity to talk about these things. I hope it's been helpful to you in your own walk with God and in your own uh, faith. Is is uh, You can have more and more confidence in the God that you believe in. I regularly talk to my students about the fact that the Bible never commends blind faith. The world would have you believe that faith is the opposite of reason, and that is not what the Bible ever talks about. God expects you to have an informed faith. God expects you to have an intellectual faith. That is the faith you find constantly in the Bible. It is not good enough to have faith in your faith. You need to have faith in your God. And to do that, you need to know why you believe in him and why you believe in his son and why you believe in the word that he has preserved for us and how you answer the difficult questions of life and on and on and on we could go. That's two semesters worth of study and I've got three days. So we're focusing specifically on some things regarding the reliability of the gospel records themselves. And that's been our, our big picture focus. And we'll come back to that this evening. But what I want to do for our assembly this morning, in part because it's, I think, a little bit closer to kind of a traditional sermon, though not really. Um, but beyond that, because it's probably the shortest thing that I could squeeze into this and everything else is going much longer. And I think we have longer windows in those other sessions to talk about what all of this means. What, what does it mean that the Bible is reliable? What does it mean that the Bible is, is trustworthy? Well, what it means ultimately is if they are what they claim to be, then they are incredibly significant in your life. In fact, they should govern every aspect of your life. That they tell you who God is and who you are in relation to God and what God expects of that relationship with him whether it is here in a church building or out there in the world as you live your life and go to your job and go shopping and drive around and whatever else you may be doing. And it impacts every aspect of your life. These documents claim to be inspired. They claim to be communication from God. And what that means is fundamentally, again, how the process of inspiration works. I'm not going to tell you I understand all that. I don't, I don't understand the mechanics of inspiration. What I understand are the implications of it. And the implications of inspiration are that these documents are authoritative in my life. They tell me who God is and what God wants me to do. The New Testament confirms the inspiration of the Old Testament. I mean, that's what Paul's talking about when he says all Scripture is inspired by God. The verse before that, Paul is talking to Timothy there about the Scriptures that he had from his youth. Now, by the time Paul's writing 2 Timothy, a fair amount of the New Testament had been written. But the, when Timothy was a child, it, it hadn't. And the New Testament as a whole wasn't even circulating at this point. I mean, for starters, it would have been missing 2 Timothy, uh, among other things, and that's not the last one written. But uh, what Paul's talking about, when he talks about the scriptures that Timothy had from his youth, he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. Now, the principle of that, I think, does apply to the New Testament as well, but what Paul's explicitly talking about are the Old Testament scriptures that are inspired by God. Now, something else about that, by the way, that you might miss, this is another of my little rabbit trails, I have to chase at least one of these off in every sermon, um, but you might notice that that verse, 2 Timothy 3.15, that we don't read nearly as much as we read, we read verses 16 and 17. What Paul says about those scriptures that Timothy had from his youth, that is to say the Old Testament scriptures, he said, these scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You want a new way to read the Old Testament that you probably haven't read it before? Read it as a document that can bring you to faith in Jesus. Jesus isn't even in there. No, he's on every page. He is all over the place if you start looking for him. And we know that this is the case because what were the apostles doing in the book of Acts when they were going around teaching the scriptures to people and bringing them to faith in Jesus? It was the Old Testament. 
And this is why I flatly reject the perspective of anyone who says, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. We've lost some two-thirds of, of a book that's all about bringing us to faith in Jesus. We want to throw that away? It tells us who God is. We need these scriptures. Now, the New Testament, you know, it's not like God came along later and came back and said, now that the New Testament canon has been completed, I firmly authorize this as inspired and you know, gives his stamp of approval or anything like that. So how do we know the New Testament is inspired? Well, uh, this is a bigger issue than our class here, but I would say that the principle of inspiration, communication from God is established in the New Testament. And the, the principle that the Holy Spirit was going to come to the apostles and bring to remembrance so they could teach fully what people need to know about Jesus is explicitly stated in the New Testament. And so what I would suggest to you is that there is a presumption of inspiration and a composition of a New Testament with that uh, as well. Now, how all of that works itself out is out, outside of the scope of our study, but the idea that the New Testament claims that these men are going to be teaching inspired communication from God is clearly there. When you read John 14 through 16, it's nowhere else. And uh, Paul talks about speaking words that were from the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And so the idea is, is certainly there. And what that means then is that if these documents are what they claim to be, that what they contain is the revelation of what God wants us to know. And if these documents contain the revelation of what God wants us to know, the implication is in, inescapable that they are authoritative in our lives. These documents are authoritative. Wait a second. I thought here in the churches of Christ, we established authority by command, example, and necessary inference. Ever heard that before? I heard that my whole life. And I heard those words, and I knew what they meant, but I had no idea what they meant. I don't know if you're in that same boat as me or not. These are words that you hear all the time. And there are two, two things, two problems with those words that we use. And I'm not going to say there's a problem with the idea, but there are two problems with those words. And I know there are problems because I see 18 to 22-year-olds every day, all year long, and I know what they think about this because they talk to me about what they think about this. And there are two things that I hear a lot. One is, what on earth does that even mean? Because when was the last time you used the phrase a necessary inference in a normal sentence, unless you were in a church building? So you, you hear it, but what does it even mean is one question that you ask. And the other is, yeah, well, where is the command, the example of the necessary inference that we establish authority by command, example, or necessary inference? If that's how we do it, why don't we find that in the Bible? You know, Second Opinions chapter 4, and this is how you will establish uh, authority by these three things. Oh, yeah, no, that, that verse isn't in there. So how do we reconcile all of, of these kinds of things? Well, let's set aside a command example of necessary inference for a second and uh, talk about communication. We hired you to come preach here. What are you talking about communication for? Well, I, I'm doing what I've done all weekend long, which is for a moment setting aside the Bible, only to come back to it a little bit later on. The question that I would ask is, how do we communicate? I would suggest to you that we communicate basically in two ways. We communicate verbally and we communicate non-verbally. Within verbal communication, there are a couple of kinds of verbal communication that we can talk about. There is, for example, explicit verbal communication, which I'm going to simplify here as telling if this is beginning to look familiar to you, it's because I've totally stolen Billy Miller's material. And, uh, well, I've, I've retooled it as my own methodology. But if you've heard Doi talk about this, this is going to sound familiar. Explicit verbal communication is telling something. You tell somebody exactly what you want them to know. It's pretty simple and straightforward. I don't think that needs much more explanation. However, what is maybe a little bit uh, more complex is implicit verbal communication, which is implying something. You don't come out and say exactly what you want them to know, but you say enough to make it clear that you, you, you want them to know something, and it is pretty inescapable what you want them to know. And so, uh, for example, if it uh, was my anniversary, and I said to my wife, honey, can I go out with the guys tonight? And she said, sure. What is she communicating to me? 
you're going to be in severe trouble if you do, right? Um, fine, you can do that. Well, she has said one thing explicitly. She has said something totally different implicitly. And we all know what that is. And it's not that she's lying. It's a rhetorical device is what it is. Uh, she is explicit or implicitly, but very clearly communicating her will in that regard. And so that's implicit verbal communication. You say something, it's not necessarily the opposite like in that example, but you say something not exactly what you want them to know, but you say enough to make it clear what you want them to know. That is implying something along those lines. Now, these principles in spoken verbal communication are also true in written verbal communication. If you're reading something rather than listening to someone, it's the same thing. You can be explicit or you can be implicit. You could say exactly what you want them to know or you can imply what you want them to know uh, in, in that regard. So spoken or written, it's the same. Now, there is also nonverbal communication. Now, nonverbal communication, of course, is body language, and uh, illustrated instructions and how-to patterning and those sorts of things uh, as, as well, which we might call showing something. If you ask me where the bathroom is and I point, nonverbal communication. <laughs> if I ask my wife if I can go out with the guys on our, our anniversary, not only does she say fine, but she crosses her arms and furrows her brows when she says it, that's a pretty good clue of what fine means, but that's nonverbal communication uh, in that regard. If I walk up to someone on the street and do like this because I have a mouthful of food and I can't talk, I'm asking them what time it is and everyone understands what that means. Um, you know, on down the line we can go with this. Uh, have you ever bought furniture from Ikea? That's written, uh, nonverbal communication. It's the worst thing in the world. Somehow it manages to get built anyway, but it's just all of these, if you've never bought it, it's ridiculous looking pictures of people building stuff and you're supposed to figure out from that how to build this bookcase you just bought. Um, somehow it works, uh, but it's, it's nonverbal is what it is. It's showing you how to do it uh, in a written form. If you want to learn how to throw a curveball, that kind of how to and you watch someone do it, they show you what to do. Sometimes there's a spoken element to it as well, but on down the line you can go. There is a showing sort of communication and there is also implicit nonverbal communication. There's not as much uh, of this, but the viewer needs to discern what is to be learned from this rather than being explicitly shown what it is that is, is, is being talked about here. And again, I would say the same principle uh, applies in, in written. It's, like I say, it's not as, as common, but it, it does work in, in both cases. Now, what all of this means is when we're talking, what we're talking about here is communication. And all communication, I would suggest to you, boils down to these three basic things, telling someone something, showing someone something, or implying to someone something. That's what communication is. It all works like this. Now, you might say, wait just a second, I don't think it does. I say, fine. Convince me that this isn't all communication, but do so without telling me that I'm wrong, showing me that I'm wrong, or implying to me that I'm wrong. You figure out how to communicate to me that I'm wrong without doing one of those three things, and I'll believe you. But until you can figure out how to do it, this is communication. This is how it works. And th this is what has been happening all through the, the course of, of human history. Now, a question that we have to ask about communication as we're going to be working our way back to how this relates to the Bible, I promise we will, uh, is, is all communication authoritative? All communication happens. Is all communication authoritative? Well, no, of course it's not. We understand that, right? You know, if you ask me where the bathroom is and I point that way, am I saying that you're morally uh, awful if you go to a bathroom in that direction instead? Well, obviously not. That's patently absurd. Uh, that's what makes that example so good is just how ridiculously absurd it is. I mean, some communication isn't authoritative. It's uh, interrogative. You're asking a question or it's merely informative or it's speculative. You're just trying to guess. You're, you're theorizing about something. So obviously all communication is not authoritative, but how does authoritative communication happen? Authoritative communication, communication happens the same way all communication happens. This is all communication, telling and showing and implying. Uh, this is how it all works. And so whether it's authoritative or not authoritative, this is, is how it all works. So you're at a loss then, right? How do you figure out the difference? Have you ever really 
struggled with this in life in general. Set aside the Bible for a second. But have you ever had someone tell you something or you, you read something in a book or you watch someone do something and you're like, I have no idea whether this is authoritative in my life or not. No, of course not. It's obvious in context, right? If it's a law, then it means something. If your parents said do something, then it means something. If it's some crackpot on the side of the street with a megaphone spouting nonsense, you carry on with your life. If someone asks you a question, you answer it. I mean, on down the line, you can go. Context and common sense answer just about all of the time whether something is authoritative or not, and you don't struggle with it. Because it's pretty simple when you stop and you think about it. Well, what does all of this have to do with the Bible? Well, again, the Bible is communication. It's God's communication to humankind. And God has communicated to us in the same way that he has given us to communicate with each other, which is to say that sometimes God tells us what he wants us to know. Sometimes God shows us what he wants us to know. And sometimes God implies what he wants us to know to a point that it's inescapable, the conclusion that he wants us to draw. And if the Bible is communication, does that mean that every single line in the Bible is authoritative? Well, no. Again, not all communication is authoritative. Well, are you saying there are things in the Bible that aren't authoritative? Yes, I am. The law is about the sacrificial system. Is that telling us that the only divinely authorized way to eat meat is to barbecue it? Now, I am tempted to answer that question in a different way than what is right. But no, that's obviously not the point of that. It is it only authorized for every Christian group for all time to, to meet in at least a second floor building because they met in an upper room. So that's where we have, well, no, that's just where they happened to be. Is the only divinely instituted clothing animal skins because that's what God gave Adam and Eve. He didn't give them the fig leaves. He took those away and gave them something else. That's what they came up with. He gave them something else. So all of us need to be wearing leather and furs, I guess. Well, no, that's not what the point of that is. And again, how do we know the difference between what is divinely inspired and, and what isn't? Or not divinely inspired, divinely authoritative. Uh, what, what we have to do and what we don't. Well, the same way we do that in every other bit of communication that we encounter all the rest of our lives. Context and common sense. You say, well, wait a second, that sounds way too subjective for me. Well, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of subjectivity there. But let me suggest to you that it's not nearly as much as you might be afraid of. There's a temptation to hear something like that and say, oh, slippery slope. You know, before you know it, we'll just be making up what's authoritative and not. Do you have that problem in regular life? You're not going to have it here either if you're looking at it honestly. I mean, if you're looking for loopholes and ways out, then yeah, you're going to have that problem. But you've got a greater fundamental problem than that if that's the way you're reading the Bible. And once that fundamental problem gets solved, the other one's going to get solved with it. If you're reading the Bible honestly, you're not going to have a major conflict on what's authoritative and what isn't. You know, oh, here we are, wringing our hands, waiting for Paul to come pick up our money and take it to Jerusalem. Because that's how you give. No, there's a principle there, and there's the specifics that's going on in Paul's own circumstances at that moment. And so let me suggest to you that this is, is basically how communication works, this is how authoritative communication works, and this is what's going on in the Bible as well. Let me turn quickly here uh, to what I'm going to call a case study of this that you find in Acts chapter 15. This is a fantastic place to look at this issue and think about this issue, because what you have in Acts chapter 15 is a major problem in the early church that people need to figure out what the answer to it is. Now, this is sometimes called a council, the church council, as if they're meeting together to figure out what they're going to do, and then they issue some edict, uh, and it's this hierarchical sort of thing. I don't think that's what's happening there. Uh, there is some decision that's being made, but notice that all of the key speakers are not deliberating on what is to be done. 
they show everyone's arguing and then Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James show up and they say unanimously this is the answer there's no debate in Acts 15 there's no deliberating in Acts 15 you've got people telling them this is what God wants and that ends the issue but how do they determine God's will so the question here that is being discussed is do Christians need to be Jews in order to be Christians and, and so you've got this problem with Gentiles coming into Christianity and a, before this, exclusively Jewish Christianity. And how can these Gentiles become Christians without, I mean, it's a Jewish Messiah. This is our Messiah who's come to us. How can they become Christians without being Jews? And we, we look back at that and say, that's a ridiculous question, but we have other, our own ridiculous questions. This is an important question in their cultural context they really struggled with. So what do we do? And so they, they asked a couple of questions. Now, they don't explicitly ask these questions, but this is what it boils down to. The, the question is, what has God communicated to us? And it really breaks down to two basic things. In verses 7 through 9, and then in verse 12, you find what God has shown to them. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 7. Uh, and after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. And jump down to verse 12. The assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And so Peter speaks first, and Peter says, there we were teaching Cornelius. And what might be implied there is we have this very same question at that moment. What are we going to do? And God makes it clear what they are going to do. They are going to baptize Cornelius and his household because they can be Christians just as they are. And how does God do that? Well, in the only case where something like this happens, the Spirit is given to them before baptism. Don't see that as some sort of exception to some other kind of rule. See it as God's test, what Peter says it is. God's testimony that he accepted the Gentiles as they were. Now, does God say the Gentiles are fine? No, God has shown it to them. The Gentiles are fine as they are. And then Paul and Barnabas speak, and they say, everywhere we go among the Gentiles, God is pouring out miraculous gifts among them. What does that tell you God thinks about the Gentiles? Again, it, it is communication. It is showing to them what is going on. And then James speaks next. And James says in verse 15, with this, this is what... Uh, uh, Simon has just said, with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it. And the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. And so James speaks up and he says, yeah, what they're telling us God has shown is exactly the same thing that God has said which is the Gentiles will come to my kingdom and be a part of my kingdom too. So what has God shown? What has God told? But there is also an element of this as well, which is what has God implied? What is all of this coming in and saying to us? Notice what, what Peter says back up in verse 10, where he says, you know, this is what God showed us when we were teaching Cornelius. He draws out for them that inescapable conclusion. He says, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. The inescapable conclusion is that the Gentiles don't need to become Jews in order to become Christians. Peter says as much. I mean, he doesn't use those words, but that's clearly what he's saying in that context. And then James will say in verse 19, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. And so the implication of what God has shown and what God has said is very clear. So here is a scene in the Bible where they needed to know the authoritative will of God. 
And so they determined what that authoritative will was by asking what God had communicated to them. What has God told us? What has God shown us? What are the implications of what God has told us and shown us? And they walk away knowing inescapably what the conclusion of the matter is. This is how you determine God's will, by asking what God has communicated. And by seeing how it fits the circumstance you're in and whether it's authoritative. Well, what does all of this have to do with our uh, issue of command, example, and necessary inference that we hear so much about? Well, let me suggest to you that that is just the other side of this very same coin. The person who is speaking or the person who is showing, they are telling, they are showing, they are implying. But to the person who tells... I'm going to learn how this thing works one day. To the person who tells, they hear a command. And, and the, the person who shows, the other person sees an example. The person who implies, the other person infers what is implied. Command example and necessary inference is nothing but the hearing side of communication. That's all that it is. That's all that it means. So there's no specific verse that says this is how we establish authority because all this is is communication. And communication from God is by nature authoritative. And so that's all that's going on with that. Now, if you want some specific example of command, example, and necessary inference to look at, go to Acts 15 because we just saw it. Again, we saw it from the side of the speaker, what God has shown, what God has told, what God has implied. But from those who were there in Jerusalem, it was what is God commanding, what is the example that we've seen, and what are we inferring from this information. But it's all just communication is all that it is. And so what that boils down to then is, is where we began, which is if the Bible is communication from God, the Bible is authoritative. Now it takes discernment, it takes common sense, it takes context to figure out which lines in the Bible are specifically applicable to my life right now in a binding kind of way. But again, we don't struggle with that in life. And we shouldn't struggle with it in the Bible either if we have honest hearts as we go to it. Well, in just a moment, we'll sing a song of invitation, but I'll do what I've been doing uh, as we've been working through this, this series, which is turn our focus to something else for a moment to kind of segue into that uh, idea. I read a story, um, or it was an illustration in a book that I was, uh, was reading at the time, and then I heard someone else uh, give this illustration in a lecture I was hearing, but uh, I, I don't know if you've heard this before or not. I don't know the exact origin of it, but it, it's just such a compelling image to me. And, and the, the picture is in the ancient pioneering days, particularly in times of drought, when they were on the plains in uh, the Midwest and out further beyond that, where the fields would be as dry as possible and there would be no elevation at all to break up any wind. So that when a fire began and a wind got behind it, it would move at a speed that you can't imagine. And what would happen in those cases is if you're in the direction the fire is moving, you're pretty well stuck because it is too big, too fast to get away from. You get on the fastest horse you've got and ride as fast as you can in the opposite direction and you're not going to outrun it. You can try to ride out at an angle to get around it and it's just getting wider and wider and you can't get around it either. There is nothing that you can do to escape this fire. So how did they live? Because they did. Well, they, they figured out that fire can only burn what hasn't been burnt yet. And so as the fire came, they would take a log from their campfire and they would put it on the ground where they were and start burning out in the direction around them. And as the space got bigger, they would move into the ground that was already scorched. And when the sweeping fire came to that area, it would find nothing left to burn and it would go safely around them. The fire of God's judgment is coming one day. And there is no escaping it. You can't run fast enough to get away from it. You can't run far enough to get away from it. You can't be good enough to get away from it. 
It will catch you and it will burn you and there is nothing that you can do about it. However, there is a place. There is a place where the wrath of God has already been poured out, where the ground has already been scorched, where you can find safety. And that place is the cross of Jesus. Because he took God's wrath that was due us. The ground is scorched. And you don't need to outrun it anymore. If you take your stand at the foot of the cross. And you trust in Jesus to save you rather than trusting in yourself to save you. Doing what he would have you to do. But putting all of your confidence in him. If there's some way that we can help you this morning, make your life right with him. Won't you let that be known as together we stand and sing?